And we're not done with worship, but I do want to invite you to go ahead and have a seat tonight. We're going to get into the Word. We're going to transition here real quick. to stop. Pastor Jason, I just wanted to keep going. So good. Hey, I'm not going to take much of your time tonight, even though preachers always say that, and they talk for an hour. I'm only going 15 minutes, then you go 45. I've done that a lot. Um, Hey, again, if you don't know me, my name is Jordan Malugin. I'm the worship pastor here, and I just want to say every time I have the opportunity to to share, uh, I never take it for granted. Um, you know, I've looked up to Pastor Jason. And I'm not trying to suck up. I'm, I'm being sincere. Um, for a long time, for many years from afar, and um, having been here almost, uh, I guess, about 20 months now, and uh, becoming great friends with you, and it's an honor to serve with you. And uh, I love this church. And outside of being a follower of Jesus and a husband to Brenna and a father to my children, um, serving this church is the greatest honor and privilege of my life. Um, at Messiah's house is home. It's home. And we've searched a long time, and, and we walked into these doors, and we knew we were where we were supposed to be. Um, and there's something special about this place. There's something about it that, I mean, people, people say it's different. I'd say it's the presence of God. Now, I'm not saying other churches don't have the presence of God, but I think you know what I'm saying. That there's something about this place. And I think it has a lot to do with you and with your hunger and with your longing, with your desire to chase after him. And I just, you know, I've got a message tonight that really um, the Lord laid on my spirit a while back. And it was more of a, a personal, a personal word, but then it quickly turned corporate. And I'm just gonna say some things tonight. And I want you to know that, that when I say the word the church, I'm not necessarily talking about Messiah's house. I'm talking about the church in general, the big C church. And, and I'm just going to be honest. I'm concerned for the church. I'm concerned for the church because there's things that I've seen. You know, I've been in, in worship for, I guess, 15, 16 years now. And I've been a part of churches that are both big and small. I've been a part of churches that had all the money in the world and churches that didn't have any money. I've been a part of worship teams that we didn't have a budget, that we didn't have money to buy fancy equipment and all the, you know, gadgets and all those things. And then I've been a part of the other side where we had everything that you could ever imagine. And one thing that's always struck me, the very first place that I ever led worship was a small church here in Amarillo. And... One of the things about it, we didn't have a lot, but what we had was the presence of God. And, and then I've, I've been at other places where we've had everything. And I'm not saying that the presence wasn't at these places, but I saw too many people who were alive walking in like they were dead. And there was no response. Does that make sense tonight? And really, there's just a... A burden in my in my spirit that that I want to attack this this idea that worship is entertainment um, because I, there's a really a concerning trend that I see in the church today is that whatever this church is doing then we have to do the same thing to try to fit into that box because really we're not chasing after presence we're chasing after popularity and I'm not saying that influence is a bad thing because I believe that it's the favor of God that gives us influence as believers. But I also believe that motives deeply matter. My motives matter. My intentions, they matter. And I just want to you know, make this statement tonight. If you find yourself being entertained in worship, then it's not really worship. We've got great musicians. We've got a really solid team. And it's easy 
to get caught up in, wow, the, listen to them. They're great. And I have to sometimes caution myself when I'm up here to say, we sound really good right now. This feels really good. I'm really nailing this song, right? And then I'm like, I'm entertaining myself. And the focus is off of, off of God, and I put it on myself. And when that happens, I become insecure. I become self-conscious. I start thinking, I'm just being real tonight. And so I want to challenge you. When you find yourself in church and, and worship is happening, and, and also I want to debunk the idea that worship is just music because it's not. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. And so we're in here and the music is playing and you find yourself being entertained. Remember, I, I don't think it's worship. I would actually say that it's, it's more pleasure at that point. Um, and perhaps it's even unpure. And I want you all to know that I wrote these notes out. And typically when I speak, I make about three or four run-throughs. I didn't do a run-through because I wanted to speak from my heart tonight. And I think that the, the sad reality is that we're seeing this, this notion, this idea of, of entertainment in the form of worship all throughout our churches. We've sacrificed the presence of God for the pleasure of being entertained. And remember, I'm not talking about Messiah's house. I'm talking about the church in general. We're a culture of instant gratification. I want it all and I want it now. Amazon Prime. We're getting that Amazon warehouse here. The first thing Nate texts me is like, same day delivery. And I'm like, yes. God is good, you know. And, 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 but that, that's the culture that we, that we live in. And we think that God is a microwave God that I can turn it on for 30 seconds and get what I want. And, and the reality, that, that's, that's not true. And I would say that the idea that we've sacrificed the presence of God for the pleasure of being entertained breaks the heart of the Father. It breaks the heart of the Father because it was never His intention for it to become what it, what it is because we've forsaken our first love. And that was the message that, that the Lord really put on my heart personally was... Why did I ever feel called in the first place? You know, I've shared my story with you guys before, and we've gone through a lot in the last three years. Um, just personally, as a family, three and a half years, really. Um, you know, many of you know that my son, Reeve, was diagnosed with leukemia um, in October of 2017. And talk about a challenge. That was a challenge. Um, and, and I've got some really good news. Actually, on the 21st of this month is Reeve's very last doctor's appointment. And, and he's done. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get emotional. But that was, it's been a difficult three and a half years. And in the midst of that, I thought it would be a good idea to try to be a senior pastor of a church. Um, and stepped into a situation that, uh, that, that was just a difficult one. And there's people in the room tonight that were there with us when, when we did that. And, and you know some of the story. Um, and, and all these things have kind of happened. And then COVID hits. And I know that it's affected all of us in different ways. Um, we've all been impacted differently by it. But I've kind of had this, this gut check, this faith check of, of where, really, what, what's my motive? Why am I doing what I do? Because I found myself wearing a church mask and, and showing up and everything's okay. I've got it all together. I don't need your help. I'm just going to show up and do my job and, and it's, it's going to be good. You're going to be entertained. And, and I found myself in that pattern and it was concerning to me because I realized that maybe, and it's a hard thing to admit, that maybe I had actually forsaken my first love. That maybe I had actually gotten away from the true reason why it is that we stand on these platforms and we do what we do. Um, I'm in the process, and this is not a plug, this is, this is not promotion, but I'm in the process right now of recording an album. And I've had these songs that I've been writing over the past three years 
that God has put on my heart. And they're songs that I've written by myself. I've, I've intentionally not, not invited other people into the process. We can get into songwriting at a different time. Some people have different opinions about that. My, my thought is David didn't need five people to write the psalms. Um, we don't need five guys getting in a room writing a song for the church to sing. Um, that's a different topic. Um, but I'm, I'm recording these songs right now, and I've had to really kind of reevaluate my motives behind it. And I've had to check myself to say, why am I doing this? Am I doing this to try to get famous? No. Am I doing this to try to, to whatever? No. I'm doing this, God, because it's a fragrant offering that I'm, I'm giving to you. It's something that you've given me, this gift, and I want to be able to give something back to you. If people want to sing the songs, that's great. If they don't, that doesn't really matter because that's not where I find my value. So I've been in this place of returning and longing to be with my first love and to remember the things that I did at first. And that's what I want to really teach on tonight for the next few moments that we have together and tell you that it's time to return to your first love. That's the reason that maybe many of you are here tonight and you might not know it. There's something that's yearning in your spirit that you're longing for and that God has drawn you into this place because God wants to be close to you. God wants to be near to you. So I want us to read. I've got Revelation chapter 2. Before we, before we get there, I just want to give some context. This is Jesus speaking to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And each letter contains six commonalities. There's six common themes that you can find if you want to read through that in, in the book of Revelation. You have the description of Jesus himself, and then he gives a commendation. So he says, this is what you are doing well. This is what you're good at. But then Jesus also gives a rebuke. You're doing this wrong. But what I love about it is he doesn't just point out the problem. He then offers a solution. He then gives the consequence of disobedience. And then he lays out a promise for those who conquer. And the first church that Jesus addressed was the church in Ephesus. Now, it's believed that this church was actually planted by Paul, the Apostle Paul himself. Um, Timothy was the pastor. I mean, talk about like an all-star staff, right? You've got Paul who planted the church. You've got Timothy who trained under Paul. You've got Paul who trained under Jesus himself, right? That's, that's pretty stellar. And so this church was very large, very influential. They had a very, very big impact in their community. And I just want to go ahead and read, if we can go to Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to start there in verse 1. It says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. That's Jesus describing himself. Verse 2. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. So there's part of his commendation. You're doing these things right. But if tested, those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false. So we're going to pause right there for a moment. So what he's saying is you have doctrinal vigilance and endurance, that you're sound in the Scripture, that you teach the Word, that you value the Word of God, and you think, well, that's all great, right? There's a bunch of us in here who know the Word of God inside and out. And sometimes we think that's enough, but look what Jesus says. Let's go ahead and keep on going to uh, verse 3. He says, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Verse 4, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. So there's his rebuke, that you have abandoned the love. I think so many times we think that Jesus is soft and sweet and that all the little children come and sit on his lap and we forget about Jesus in the temple turning over tables. Jesus is rebuking the church here. He says, hey, I love you. And this is the sign of a good father. Hey, I love you. 
you're doing these things well, but here's something that needs correction. And so he says, you've abandoned the love you had at first. You know the word of God. You're sound in the scripture. You're seeking out false prophets. You're doing all these things right, but you have abandoned the love you had at first. How many of you know the scripture says that without love, you are nothing? That without love, you're just a clanging symbol. Imagine if for a moment I just had Jordan, our drummer, come up and say, just bang on the cymbals, bro. Just bang on the cymbals. That's going to be our worship today. That wouldn't be very good. It actually would be pretty annoying, right? I've never heard anybody do that. Say, hey, just hit the cymbals. Just keep on playing it. No, it's, it's loud. It's obnoxious. It's annoying. So they've abandoned the love that they had at first, and it's interesting that if you read the book of Ephesians, I'm not going to have this scripture on the screen, but if you read the book of Ephesians, the very last thing that Paul himself writes in this letter, in Ephesians 6, verses 23 and 24, he says, Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith from God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. So the very last thing that he says is basically this, don't lose your love. Yet even with that warning, Jesus comes to them in Revelation and says, you've lost the love that you had at first. You've lost your love. But again, what I love about him, he doesn't just stop at the problem. He offers a solution. He offers a solution. Look at verse 5. He says, remember. Everybody say remember. He says, remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. So here's the solution. He says, remember where from where you have fallen. Repent. And then we could say return to the things that you did at first. And here's what happens. If you don't do that, he says this, continuing. He says, if not, I will come to you and I will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So he gives the solution, do this thing. But if you don't, here's the consequence of disobedience. Essentially this, I will remove my presence from you. I will remove my presence from you. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a part of a church that the presence of God isn't there and moving and active. Amen? And I feel like tonight that there is a call for each and every one of us in this room to return to the place of our first love. I'm not talking about your freshman year of high school going to church camp and you know we had those moments where you're around the campfire and you're throwing in your Limp Biscuit CDs and you know Lincoln Park that's old school right there and and like I'm, I'm gonna change I'm never gonna listen to this stuff again I'm gonna break up with that girl or with that guy I'm not gonna ever google anything inappropriate ever again. I'm going to put safeguards on all my stuff and I'm going to have accountability partners and then three weeks later we've fallen back into the same trap. I'm not talking about that but I'm talking about the moment when Jesus truly captured your heart. The moment when he truly captured you. The moment when you said yes and you meant it. The moment when you said yes and there was transformation. But the thing about life is that life happens. Life happens and time passes by. And how easy is it to forget? That's why it says, remember from where you have fallen. Remember the heights from where you have fallen. Remember where you once were. I think that's the problem in the church today. And again, I'm focusing in on, on the worship movement because that's, that's kind of where I live is that we have worship leaders and even pastors who got into this thing with good intentions, with good motives. But once popularity started to creep in, 
And once these things of the world begin to creep in and the church started moving away from kingdom culture and started trying to fit into worldly culture to be popular and relevant and attractive for outsiders and watering down the word of God and playing three songs with tracks and not allowing the spirit to move. That's where the disconnect is. And I've been a part of that church. And I'm telling you, it's not fun and it's not good and it doesn't please the Lord. There is a place tonight where we can return to that place of intimacy. And that's really what I feel like this is. It's a place of returning to intimacy. I don't know about you, but the most powerful moments I've had with the Lord have not happened on this stage, but it's happened when I'm alone. It's happened when it's just me and Him. My kids are little right now, and I still have the pleasure and the privilege of my kids wanting me to hold them wanting me to, to love on them. And I just think about one day that's going to be gone. And there's going to be nothing more that I want than to hold my kids. And I think that maybe God is saying, I want to hold you. I want to hold you tonight. I want to love on you and kiss on you and do all the things that we used to do. I want to hold your hand as you run through the park. I want to do all these things. Remember what we used to do? Yeah. One of my favorite stories in Scripture is when Jesus teaches the, the parable of the prodigal son. Many of you know the story. I'm going to paraphrase it tonight. Worship team, y'all can go ahead and come back up here. Um, you can find it in Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11. Jesus tells this story, and, and in, in Luke chapter 15, he gives three parables of the, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and of the prodigal son. Really to show that anytime something is lost, the father runs after it because he values every single one of us. Paints a beautiful picture of God the father and his relationship with us. That he'll leave the 99 every time to get the one. It's beautiful to think about. And so we see this parable in Luke 15. And, and we, have, uh, we have a father who has two sons. And uh, one of the sons one day decides that I want my inheritance. I want it all. I want it right now. And what does he do? The father really, I believe, out of the mercy of the father... He said, okay, son, if this is what you want, I'm going to give it to you. Here it is. And the Bible tells us that he went away to faraway land. We could basically say maybe he moved off to Las Vegas, and he did Vegas. You know, he wasted all of his money on everything that you could possibly imagine, all kinds of evil and everything. Yeah. Wasted it all. One day he wakes up and he's sleeping with the pigs. And he finds himself in, the, in this, this pit with the pigs. And, and he's eating the food that the pigs eat because he doesn't have anything else. And the Bible says that he comes to his senses. And he remembers who he was. That he remembered, wait a second, I am a son of my father. And my father has all that I need. So he remembered. The next thing he did was, in his mind, he began to repent. He began the journey home. And I imagine he makes up this long speech and he rehearses it over and over and over. Dad, I'm sorry. Dad, I'm sorry. The Bible says that he said, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Would you please let me come home? I'll be a, I'll be a servant in your house, Dad. If you just let me come back. Even though I'm a son, I'll be a servant. The Bible says that he began this journey home. And what I love about it, and this is what I want us to understand tonight. What I love about this story is that we see this son who is broken down, who's beaten up, who's lost everything. Who's lost everything. Who's wasted all that his father ever gave him. He said, I'm going to come home. And while he's on the road home, 
his dad wasn't just sitting on the front porch, wasn't doing anything else. The Bible says that his dad was watching for him. And it says while he was far off, that his dad saw him and he began running to his son. He began running to his son because he loved his son. And tonight, I just want to extend the invitation to you. There is a chance tonight for you to return to your father. There is a chance tonight for you to return. You know what the best part of the story is? I almost forgot. That when the father embraces the son, the Bible says that he kisses him and he loves on him and he hugs him. He gives him a ring. He says, go get my son some new clothes and we're going to have a party. We're going to celebrate because my son was lost, but now he's found. He was dead, but now he's alive. Come on, there is a party tonight that you are invited to, that God is offering you to step into tonight. So come on, everybody back on your feet. We're going to get back into worship. I think I want to open up, Pastor Jason, if it's okay with you, just have the front open up down here. Um, I just want to invite you tonight. You can return to the place of intimacy. You can return right here, right now to this altar. If there's anything in you that you need to lay down tonight, anything that you need to bring to your Father Church, I want to encourage you. Come on, this is open right now. It's open right now. We're going to get back into worship. We're going to sing about returning to our first love. But I want to encourage you to listen for the voice of your father tonight. Listen for his voice.
Then you run into me, Lord. the song and I hear the song you sing it you're crying out run child or run father I am returning and I'll stay where I belong cause I hear the song you sing it you're crying out run child or run father I am returning and I'll stay where I come on I hear the song you sing it. You're crying out, run, child, run. Father, I am returning. And I'll stay where I belong. Oh, I hear the song you sing it. Come on. You're crying out, run, child, run. Father, I am. Come on, we're going to keep singing that. I hear the song.
been just worshiping I was just standing there and I felt like the Lord wanted me to come give this word that someone was here tonight that's been contemplating suicide and you've been wondering if God sees you you've been crying out to him and it's been silent you you felt very far very far away not only from God but from everybody you hate who you are when you look in the mirror. You feel like you have no purpose. And you've been wondering, God, why won't you speak to me? And the Lord said for me to come up here tonight and say, this is him right now speaking to you to draw you out to say it's time to come home. You have purpose. This is a divine moment for you right now. You've wanted a sign. Here's your sign right now. God is speaking. I I wasn't even supposed to come up tonight. And I just felt this so strongly about this coming home and running and going to God tonight. And and I just, I want to be just bold here. This may be a word for more than one one person. Uh, if, if If you've just been really struggling with with just life in general what's what's the point i just want you to come tonight i just want you to run i just want you to come to god tonight just run to god tonight don't worry about what anybody else thinks in this place i just want you to come right now you may already be up here i don't know but I want you to come tonight and let people love on you, let people pray for you, but more importantly, have an encounter with God tonight. Have an encounter with God tonight. So I'm just going to extend this invitation one time. I know this is a very difficult moment for you. Your heart's probably beating out of your chest and you don't want people to know you've been struggling, but this is so much bigger. This is why we're here. This is what this is about. And we just want to say, come home. If you're supposed to come back to God, I want you to come right now. I'm supposed to come back. I'm supposed to come back to the Father tonight. Would you just come right now? Don't wait. Don't wait. Come, Lord. Let's just all begin to pray. Pray in the Spirit right now. We're in a battle right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Thank you, God. Anybody else? Just come on right now. Just come. It's not too late. You don't have to say anything. I just want you to come. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just, I want to ask our altar ministry team tonight, if you came ready to to pray for some folks, We've, we've had a couple of people come here. I don't know what all's happening right now, but I want us to just be sensitive to maybe uh, come and if God's leading you to pray over somebody, pray over them. And let's just really give this moment to the Lord and let's, let's just, let's go after God. Father, we just bless you right now. We thank you for what's happening in this moment. God, I believe that you're changing the course for somebody right now. You're changing it right now. God, they came in here one way wondering What's the point? And they're leaving here with real purpose. I just thank you for it right now, God. Yeah, come on. 
Come on. Anybody else? Come on. Let's just, let's just go after God. And I hear the song you're singing. You're crying out, run, child, run. Father, I am returning. And I'll stay where I belong. Because I hear the song you're singing. You're crying out, run, child, run. Father, I am returning. And I'll stay where I belong. Because I hear the song you're singing. Father, I am returning. And I'll stay one more time. I hear, oh, I hear the song you're singing. You're crying out, Lord, child, Lord. Father, I am returning. And I'll stay where I belong.
spoke and confessed And you I am blessed Now I walk in the light In victorious sight of you I'll never be the same
something so special happening in the room right now and all day I've had this this scripture on my mind from John chapter 11 it's when Jesus calls Lazarus from the tomb he says here's what verse 38 says it says then Jesus deeply moved again came to the tomb it was a cave and a stone was lying against it remove the stone Jesus said Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, there's already a stench because he's been dead four days. How many of you know four days is nothing to our God? Jesus said, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? I believe we're seeing the glory of God in this room right now. So they removed the stone Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you hear me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd standing here, I say this so that they may believe you sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out bound hand and foot with linen strips and with his face wrapped in cloth. And Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. Here's a couple of things that are interesting to me. Jesus stood at the tomb he looked up he looked to his father and he said i thank you that you hear me but what he did next is he called lazarus by name he called him by name because lazarus was dead but when jesus speaks your name you have no choice but to come alive some of you in here are spiritually dead and god is calling you to move He's calling you to move out of your comfort zone. He's calling you to move from that place of woundedness, of brokenness. He's calling you to move from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive. If he can call a physically dead man back to life, why can't he call a spiritually dead man back to life? I believe that tonight in this room there are some of you standing there and you feel the urge to move to move into the aisle, to move up front. And we want you to know that in this house, you have freedom to do that. You have freedom to move from death to life. I believe the word for you tonight is move. So we encourage you during this next song to move out of your comfort zone, to move out of your own way and let God have his way in your heart. So God, we just say you and you alone. Father, you are good. Father, you are the one who can raise people from the dead after being, after being dead for four days. Jesus, some of us have been spiritually dead for years, but tonight we are going to come back to life. Father, we are going to come back to life. Father, we are going to come back to life. Jesus. 
now. I feel like the Lord wants to touch somebody with the left elbow, something in your left elbow. I don't know if that's you. You don't have to raise your hand. I just feel like he wants to heal you right now. Left elbow. Thank you, Lord. Let healing come. We declare it. We don't have a plan. We're out of songs. But the spirit's still moving. And my phone was playing music in my pocket. I was hearing something. I thought, Holy Spirit. We're just going to let him keep moving tonight. We'll stay up here. There's ministry going on. Spirit's moving in this place. I feel like the Lord said this is a great time to practice intimacy with Him. Take me back to the place where we started from. 